Beginning in verse one, it says this. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must not work the works, excuse me, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day because night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said these things, Jesus spit on the ground and he made mud with his saliva. And then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, now go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And so the man went and washed and came back seeing. The title of my message today, for those of you that are taking notes, is Jesus, the healing one. Jesus, the healing one. Over the past few weeks, we've talked about Jesus being the saving one, Jesus being the anointed one, Jesus being the scandalous one, Jesus being the chain breaker, Jesus being the light of the world. Last week, Jesus being the great I am. But today, I wanna talk to you specifically about Jesus being the healing one. I wanna talk to you about how God wants to bring about healing in our lives. I believe this. I believe that Jesus still heals today, and perhaps for many of you here this morning, he wants to do a miracle in your life as well. I want to talk to you about Jesus being the healer, and I want to encourage you guys today as we go through this verse by verse, I want to encourage your faith. I want to give you the permission to get a little out to get a little outrageous with your faith, to get a little audacious with your faith, to get a little bold with your faith today. Because I believe that God wants to bring healing, but it often happens in ways that are unconventional and unexpected. We pick up where we left off last week and Jesus has just left the temple after the feast and he is confronting uh, and has confronted some of the religious leaders that were ready to stone him for the blasphemous claim of making uh, this statement, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. So he equates and, and makes this claim of equality with God. He equates himself with God. And for this reason, they pick up stones to basically put him to death right then and there. So he takes off, he flees the temple, and on his way out of the temple, him and his disciples see this man who was born blind from birth. Born blind from birth. And interestingly enough, the disciples have a few questions about him. They ask this, who has sinned? This man or his parents? In other words, whose fault is this? So immediately they wanna figure out who to blame. They wanna figure out who they can place fault at. And the backdrop of this question, I think are some other lingering problems with their worldview that Jesus is about to address and dissect with his response. They presume, like many people at this time and many people even in our world today, that the world is built on a retribution principle. What is the retribution principle, Pastor Jason? It's simply this, you get what you deserve, and if you did something to deserve it, you must have done something wrong. It's essentially, you reap what you sow, you get what you deserve, if you did something good, you're gonna get blessed, and if you did something bad, you're gonna be punished. And this idea has crept into their worldview, it undergirds much of their understanding of, of God and even Torah itself. And so they see this man born blind and immediately they have a question about whose fault it is. So who do we get to blame here, Jesus? Like who, who do we get to point the finger at, Jesus? And Jesus responds, neither this man nor his parents sinned, you guys, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. I want you to notice this great contrast we see here immediately within the text. They see a problem, blindness, perhaps sin, Blame, but Jesus sees an opportunity. They wanna place blame on the man, but Jesus wants to bring glory to his father. They don't really even care about him or at least demonstrated that they care, and yet Jesus cares deeply for him as we've just seen because he heals him. Now, I would say to us, there's two miracles that take place in this story. There's the miracle of the physical and God's ability to heal and to cure the man's physical blindness. But I would also say that there's another miracle at work that we're about to see in just a moment. Before we get to that, I don't want us to miss 
this, though. So pause with me for a second. Implied in the disciples' question are deeper issues that I think all of us wrestle with. Like, why is the world so broken? Anybody wrestle with that? How about this one? Why so much suffering and pain, right? Uh, Why so much evil? Surely there must be a cause or someone to blame. And isn't that what we do when things go wrong in our life? When we get the report from the doctor that we weren't expecting or anticipating, we wanna know what to blame. Was it my bad eating? Was it my alcoholism? Was it my parents' fault? Was it, right? And we start pointing the finger at causes Was it too much exercise? Was it not enough exercise? (laughs) Who's to blame? Or what about this? When our our friends or our loved ones find out they have cancer? Or what about when we have that miscarriage? Or what about when things go wrong in our life? We start pointing the finger at all these different causes. We start wondering, who do we blame? Whose fault is it? Like the disciples' question. Jesus, was it the man's fault or was it his parents' fault? At the core of it all, what are we essentially doing? We're doing what the disciples are doing here. We're assuming the retribution principle and we're playing the blame game, which is really something that I think we've been doing from the very start. In the, in the beginning, when man and woman were in the garden, with God. We see it in Genesis 3. The enemy comes in in the form of a serpent, tempts them to eat of the tree that they were commanded not to eat of, and they sin, and sin enters into the world. And God confronts them as a loving father, like, where are you? What are you doing? What's happened in your life? And what do they do? They immediately start pointing the finger. They start blaming each other. Adam goes, well, God, it's the woman that you gave me. So he actually starts blaming God. Essentially, God, it's your fault because you gave me this woman, right? And then he's blaming Eve. And then God asks Eve, like, why have you done this? And and then Eve goes, no, God, it's the serpent's fault. The devil deceived me. The serpent deceived me. And immediately there's just like this, this exchange of blame, pointing the finger. And that's what we do in our lives when we're broken. We start pointing at things and people and we start placing the cause at the feet of others and we start wanting to know whose fault it is. As we're about to see, Jesus is about to confront this in a very powerful way. I want you to notice, though, what Jesus doesn't do here. Jesus doesn't blame the Father. Jesus doesn't blame God. Jesus doesn't say it was God's fault. Jesus didn't say that God caused it. We have to be very careful when we read this text because it's easy to gloss over this and to just just assume that it must be God's fault, right? Isn't that what we wrestle with? But Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't blame God because God is not the author of blindness. God is not the the author of sickness. God is not the author of evil. He's not the author of when things go wrong in our life. And some of us need to have that settled in our hearts. We need to have it settled that God is good and that there is no darkness or shadow in him. He is not a man that he should lie. He's good. Essentially, in his core, he's good. And because of that, he can use these things for our good. He can use the man's blindness for what? His glory. To display a work of glory. And that's what Jesus is pointing and directing them to in this moment. When many of us are surrounded by so much evil in the world, it's easy to want to blame our politicians. It's easy to want to blame our parents. It's easy to want to blame our schools. It's easy to want to blame something. But what if what we see around us is just a setup for God to do something extraordinary? What if it's just the incubating room for for glory to be born and to be shown forth in our lives? What if it's just a setup for God wanting to display glory in and through your life? What if God's up to something unforeseen? I believe this, 
that the man's blindness was a setup for God to do a mighty work in his life. And could it be that all these things that we wrestle with, these storms, these struggles, are the very mechanisms in our life that God wants to use to showcase his power and his glory to? That's what I want us to think about this morning. You know, years ago, I wrestled with chronic ear pain. I grew up in Southern California, for those of you that don't know me or my story, and I spent a lot of time at the beach. I spent a lot of time in the ocean. I spent a lot of time swimming. And I had really bad swimmer's ear every year. It was so bad. My mom tried all the remedies from like the wax candles, right? You guys ever do that? Some of you are like, nope, that's crazy. Yeah, it was. All the, the, the home, homeopathic, herbal, and organic remedies, tried all of the, the medicines, tried all the things we could do, heating, pat, all those things, and nothing worked. And for years, I would just suffer in pain through this, and it would go away, and it would come back, and it would go away, and it would come back, even into my young adult years, and it got so bad that even when I would get on an airplane to fly, my ears wouldn't pressurize. So I'd go up into the air, and it was like, people were shoving daggers into my eardrum because the pressure was so bad and so dramatic that I would just literally be sitting there writhing in pain, oftentimes just crying and just trying to like grit my teeth and bear through it. It was bad. In fact, one trip to my family's house, my parents now live in Texas, one one trip I landed and my ears never opened up and I couldn't hear the entire week. And my parents were like, what is going on with you? And I'm like, I don't know. And I'll be honest, for years, I cried out to God, like, God, would you heal me? Would you just end the pain? Would you just deliver me from this thing, right? Wouldn't you? (laughs) Yeah. And nothing happened for years. And I'll be honest with you guys, just transparent. I was discouraged. For those of you that have battled chronic pain or or sickness or illness, it's discouraging, right? When you don't get the miracle you're praying for, believing for, and your heart starts to wonder, like, God, is there sin in my life? Is, did I do something wrong? Did my parents do something wrong? Whose fault is it, Jesus? That's essentially what I was wrestling with until the healer showed up in my life. Went on a flight with Candace, my wife, and uh, we actually were living in Jackson Hole, Wyoming at the time, and we were flying into Salt Lake, of all places, and we went up, And of course, my ears didn't pressurize. They didn't get to equilibrium. They didn't open up. And I just started, I just, that pain came in. And the, you know, just the anxiety of it alone. Like, am I, is it gonna happen today? And it happened. And I just remember like, ah, just like, it was so painful. And people were looking at me like I was having a heart attack. And I'll never forget the moment that my wife said, Jason, we're gonna pray for this and I'm gonna pray for you. And she put her hands on my ear. In fact, she did something a little unconventional. She didn't spit thank God. (laughs) I mean, she could have, but she didn't. She just put her finger right in my ear and she just began to pray. And I'll tell you what, within 30 seconds of her prayer, with her hand on my ear, I heard six pops. Pop, 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 pop. It just like opened up. And can I tell you something? I've never had pain in my ear ever again, ever again. It was almost musical, the cadence and the, what I heard, it was like this crescendo, like, and it was like, ah, ah, and I'll tell you what, the healer showed up in that cabin that day on that flight and he healed me. Now, could God have healed me much earlier? Yeah, yeah, sure, he could have, but I don't know that I would have been that impressed or even remembered it. If God walked into my room as a kid, I don't know that I'd be standing here before you testifying and giving God the glory for it in the way that I am now. Could God have healed me without my wife being there? Yes, he could have. In the same way that God could have healed the man's eyes without spitting in the mud and making a mud pie for the guy's eyes. The mud pie guy. (laughs) He could have done it. He could have done it. But that's not what he chose to do because... And in this instance of this man, God had a specific moment in plan to use this guy's pain to bring about an extraordinary purpose for his life. Can I say this? God wants to oftentimes redeem 
and use your pain to bring about purpose in your life. To bring about purpose in your life. My name, Jason, means healer. And throughout my life, I've seen God heal. I've seen God do creative miracles. I've seen God do amazing things in the lives of people that I've prayed for. Oftentimes, even when I'm ministering in worship and I'm playing my guitar, I've seen people encounter miracles. I believe that God is the healer. I believe that Jesus is the healing one. And I've seen it happen too much not to believe. Some of you are here today and you've experienced healing. I just was talking with, with Billy before the service, and if you guys don't know Billy, he's a great guy, great, great dude. He's been coming for a while now, and he's been battling cancer. And today, he, he came up after worship and said, I just went to uh, get some tests done this week, and they can't find cancer in my blood anymore. It's awesome. It's so awesome. And we give God praise for that. Crystal, who's in the back. <laughs> Get to know Crystal and, and hear her story. She has an amazing story of how God healed her on death's doorstep, just knocking on the door, and God did an amazing miracle for her. I believe in a God of miracles. I believe that God can and will do that for you too. And that's our belief. That's our expectation as Christians, that God just can't, doesn't just want to or just can't. Wait, I'm getting confused here. That God just can't do it. He wants to do it. There it is. There it is. He wants to do it, but he'll use our pain and he'll use these moments in our life in unexpected ways if we allow him to. The Apostle Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse uh, 7 through 12, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show forth that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way. Anybody ever face affliction? But we're not crushed. We're perplexed. Anybody ever get perplexed? Like, why is this happening to me? But not driven to despair. We are persecuted. Anybody been persecuted for your beliefs or the way that you live your life, but not forsaken or left alone? We are struck down. Anybody ever been struck down? Anybody ever get knocked down before? But we're not destroyed. Verse 10, we're always carrying in us, in our bodies, the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Thank you, Lord. What do you notice here? Pain being turned into purpose. Affliction being used for glory. Death being the setting or the setup to bring forth new life. So that what? So that the life of Jesus may be put on display, the text says, made manifest. In other words, so that the glory of God can be known. So that the glory of God can be known. And, and to serve as a witness to other people all around us. John chapter nine, verse eight through 12 says this. And the neighbors and those who had seen the blind man before as a beggar were saying, is this not the same guy? Is this not the same dude who used to sit and just beg and cry out for help? Some said, some said it is he. And others said, no, nah, it's a guy, but it's, it's, it's like him. But he kept saying, I am the man. I am the man. And so they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? How did this happen to you, dude? And he answered them, the man came, named Jesus came and he made mud, and he anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. You see, Jesus earlier says to his disciples that the man's blindness is a setup for the works of God to be put on display through him. And what's the result? The result is not just that the man receives his sight. The result is that his neighbors find out. His family find out. His friends find out. In other words, the man's... Miracle becomes his witness to his community. His story becomes his witness about the glory of God in his life. It testifies to Jesus. It provides evidence for Jesus. And I want to say to some of you today, your stories are powerful. Your testimonies about what God has done for you, however big or however small, whether he's healed your ear, whether he's healed you of cancer, or whether he's just healed your heart from brokenness that was caused by a parent who left you when you were young. Your story carries power because your story displays his glory. It displays the glory of God in a unique way. 
Many times, you see, Jesus heals people because he has compassion. He just, he, he feels like what we feel and he heals people because of that compassion. Other times he, he heals as in the instance with this guy because he wants to reveal something about who he is to the world. He wants to reveal something about who he is as the healer. Jesus, the anointed one, the light of the world, the saving one is also the healing one. He's the healer and he wants people to know that he can heal and not just physical blindness, but also spiritual blindness as well. I mentioned at the start of my message that there's two miracles that are going on here. There's the physical and there is the spiritual. You see, the real problem in this story is not the man's inability to see, but rather it was the people's inability to see who just walked into the room, who was in front of them the whole time. Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Which is why he uses the man's eyewitness account, get it, eyewitness account, <laughs> to tell the community about him. And what's really cool and encouraging about this is that he'll do the same thing with you. He'll use your story and your witness while you're at work with your friends to tell the world about him. And I think that's really the crux of it, is that, yes, am I thankful for, for being healed? Am I thankful for what I've seen God do? 100%. But you know what? I'm even more thankful for how God's used that to reveal his goodness and his glory in the lives of other people. And he wants to do that with us if we'll let him. Verse 13. And so they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked Jesus how he, or excuse me, asked the man how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and now I see. And some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. See, the Pharisees get tripped up on the fact that Jesus heals on the Sabbath, that Jesus performs a work of glory on the Sabbath. They didn't see that the man who was blind from birth can now see. And they're tripped up on this. But here's the deal. People are going to get tripped up on this in your life, too. They will. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. They were divided. There was disunity. Verse 17, and they said again to the blind man, they still can't believe him. What do you say about him since he's opened your eyes? And the blind man said, he is a prophet. And the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind and how is it that he now sees? The Pharisees make a decision in their heart to cling to their unbelief. I tell people this all the time. Wrestle with your doubts. Wrestle with your uncertainty. Wrestle with your questions. God can handle it. But don't get sucked into a lifestyle and a commitment to unbelief. Unbelief says, I won't believe it even if I see it. This man's eyes are open and the Pharisees are like, nope, we're not gonna believe. Nope, he's not the Messiah, he's not the Christ. Nope, don't be surprised when people in your life can't believe what you believe because they're spiritually blind. They're spiritually blind. And Jesus is about to jump into this in a real way and he, and he says this, um, and his parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Go ahead and ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Verse 22. And his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. I want to say it again. There are going to be people in your life who will refuse to believe even if you give them the evidence, even if you show yourself before them. They're not gonna believe, and they're not gonna understand what God's done for you. But tell them anyways. But tell them anyways. But share truth in love anyways. And don't be afraid of being misunderstood or mislabeled. Can I tell you this? God doesn't care about your reputation. Jesus doesn't care about your reputation as much as you do. He cares about his father's reputation. 
He's not concerned about people and what they think about us. He's not concerned. I think that's, that's partially why he spits in the ground and rubs it in the, the dude's eye. I think he's just deliberately messing with them. He's, he's being deliberately offensive because he wants to mess with them. He wants to, he wants to rile them up. He wants to, to bring an element of concern. He wants to stir the waters. He wants to do what only he can do. Don't be surprised when Jesus wants to do that in your life too. And that's what we see him do next here as well. We see in verse 22 an interesting response from the parents. The parents get afraid. They're like, we're gonna get thrown out of the temple. We're gonna get thrown out of the synagogue if we make the claim that Jesus did this. Which brings us to an interesting moment in the story. They start to fear man rather than fear God. But all of us are faced with that when we're with our friends and our family and those that don't profess to know Christ. We can fear what they're gonna think. We can fear man or we can fear God or we can trust God or we can believe that God just might be at work and ready to do a miracle for them as well. Verse 23, therefore his parents said, he is of age, ask him in verse 24. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind. So they bring the guy back in again and they said to him, now give glory to God. By the way, he already did that. <laughs> For we know that this man, meaning Jesus, is a sinner. Like, he, he, can't have, he can't be holy. He can't be righteous. He can't be the Messiah. He's got to be a sinner. So they start accusing Jesus of being a sinner here. And the man answered, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I can tell you, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I've told you guys already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Now the man starts to crank up the sarcasm. I love it. Verse 28, and they reviled him. They hated him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. So they claim their heritage and their tradition. And they say, we know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from, which is actually a lie. They know where he comes from. Verse 30, and the man answered, why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone's ever opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him saying, you were born in utter sin, and you would sit here and teach us. So they cast him out. Once again, they go back to the finger pointing and the blame. They tell him he's a sinner and that this happened to him because he sinned. So the healed man loses his place in the community over this. He loses his place in the synagogue over this. He's cast out because they refuse to believe because they cannot see. Now the real blindness has been revealed. And it's not the man who got the mud put in his eyes. It's the Pharisees. It's the religious leaders here. It's the religious. And I'll say this, don't be surprised when other people can't see what you see. Don't be surprised because like Jesus said, they're the blind leading the blind. Don't be surprised by those who reject Christ or what he's done in your life because as 2 Corinthians chapter four reminds us, Verse three, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Verse five, for what we proclaim is not of ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord. With ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has also shown that light in our hearts to give understanding to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, be thankful that God's turned the lights on for you. Be a person that's thankful. In the month of November, it's oftentimes a great time for us to, to calibrate our hearts and to recenter our hearts around gratitude and thanksgiving and to be thankful for 
all that the Lord has done, however small or however big. And this is what the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church is doing here. He's encouraging them to be a people of thanks, to be thankful that God invaded their blindness and turned the light on so that they could see. And each and every one of us who has called on the name of Jesus has had this happen for us and to us as well. And for that reason, we can and should rejoice, church. We should be a people that wake up every day excited over the fact that we who were once blind can now see. Which means that we need to be vigilant in our mission to turn on the lights for others. To turn on the lights for others, or at least to help. Now, many of us, why we get discouraged when we don't see people respond the way we want them to is because they don't respond the way we responded because they're still in darkness. They're still blind. They're still uh, veiled. They still can't see it. This happens for two reasons, I believe. The Bible tells us because people love the darkness because their works are evil. Some people love darkness. And as hard as that is for us to fathom, there are people that actually love doing evil. And to try to bring truth to them is, is hell. Because they've chosen darkness and they've chosen to dwell there and they've chosen a life because they're actually in love with it. And number two, because like Paul says here, the God of this world has blinded their minds. So what's our response? What's our job? As I said last week, we speak the truth in love. We pray that God would open their eyes as he's opened our eyes and remove blinders and scales from their eyelids. And then we trust him with the outcome. We trust God with the outcome, amen? Remember, God is the healer you and I are not. God is the healer. God is the only one that can turn the lights on for others. You and I don't get to force that reality on people. And this is tough because we love people. We want them to know the truth. We want them to come to the light, but we can't force that on others, which is why oftentimes when you pray for people, especially with regards to healing, you need to ask them, as Jesus often asked people, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want God to do for you? You'll be surprised. Sometimes I've asked people that and their response is, I don't want to be healed. I don't want God to do anything for me. Surprisingly, the answer isn't always what we think it's going to be. Sometimes people don't want to be healed, so we can't force that on people. Sometimes people who have been suffering don't want to suffer anymore and they're just ready to go home and be with Jesus. <laughs> Can I say this? Heaven is not a consolation prize. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So whether we get a foretaste of his kingdom come now and we get to receive healing now or in the next life, make no mistake, we will experience it all the full, all the more when we're with Jesus. That's why Paul would say this in Romans 8. He says, as believers, we groan. And though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory to come, we still long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. Anybody wake up with, with creaks in their bones and long for your body to be released from the suffering? Some of you older ones are like, yes and amen, Pastor Jason. Gosh, I know I do. And we too, he goes on to say, wait with this eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including, including, here it is, the new bodies that he's promised us. Amen. Some of you young, young ones are like, I don't know what you guys are hooping and hollering. Give it a few more years. Give it a few more. Give it a few more. <laughs> you guys, make no mistake, there's coming a day when we're going to experience healing in a greater capacity than we'll ever experience this side of eternity. So what's our response? Back to the Gospel of John, verse 35. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out, the man out, and having found him, isn't that cool? Jesus just goes and pursues this guy. After he's lost his social status, after his place in the synagogue's been compromised, Jesus goes after him, and I love that about Jesus. And he says to the man, do you believe in the Son of Man? That was an expression that Jesus often used to refer to himself. Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? So interestingly enough, Jesus has done this miracle for him, and he still doesn't know who he is. He tells the, the Pharisees earlier, he's a prophet, I think. And Jesus says to him, and I love this, he makes it real clear. He says, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. 
Jesus, once again, makes this claim. It's me. I'm the son of man. I'm the son of God. And the man's response, verse 38, says this. Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. What's our response to when God brings about healing in our lives? Belief and worship. Belief and worship. Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. The truth is the man wasn't fully healed until he actually believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, his physical eyesight was already taken care of. But it wasn't until he responded to this question that his spiritual eyesight was also taken care of. Because belief enables the heart to see. Belief always enables the heart to see. When we believe, we actually see things the way they are, with clear vision. And it allows our hearts to become engaged with hope and expectation about the future, this eager hope that we wait with, which then leads us to worship. If belief enables the heart to see, worship commands our hearts to sing. And I would say it's a powerful expression. Even if you only have one of those voices that Jesus loves. <laughs> Even if you only got a voice that only Jesus loves, sing. Some of you are like, yeah, I, I do it, but in my shower. That's great. Sing in the shower. Sing on the way to work. Get in your car and sing. Can I tell you this? You've been given a reason to sing. You've been given a reason to worship. And what we believe in, we will behold. And what we behold, we will worship. What we believe in, we will behold, and what we behold, we will worship. As I said last week, all of us have to make a decision about who's going to get our worship, because there's a battle going on in our world, in our culture for worship right now, isn't there? And unfortunately, some people are just going to choose to worship blindly. As it goes on to say here, verse 39, and Jesus said, for judgment, I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near Jesus heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt, meaning physically. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains, meaning spiritually. Jesus makes it pretty clear and simple for us. Apart from belief in him, those that profess to see are actually the, the truly blind ones, the truly lost ones, and their guilt remains meaning they've already been judged, they've already been condemned, they've already sentenced themselves to death because of their lack of belief, because of their refusal to believe. But those, like many of us in this room who now believe, who've opened our hearts to this reality, have become the found. We are those who spiritually see, and our guilt has been acquitted and taken away by the work of Jesus on that cross. You now stand guiltless before the Father. What an amazing reality we have, people of God. What an amazing Savior we profess. So I wonder, in closing today, have you made that decision to believe? To believe in the Son of Man, the healing one. If not, why, why wait? What are you waiting for? For those of you listening to this podcast or watching this message online, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? You waiting for more evidence? I could march people before you that have been healed and set free by God himself and you may not still believe it. So what are you waiting on? Jesus said, blessed are those who believe who haven't seen. Some are like, ah, if I could just touch him, if he just walked in this room right now, if he could just appear through the walls, I mean, that'd be pretty cool. But Jesus said, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet chose to believe. I wonder if that might be some of you today.